Welcome to Guy Shrub Soul and to all of you for joining us this evening. We've had almost as many registrations actually as our inaugural talk with Fergal Sharkey almost two years ago, which is fantastic. We've got a number of activist groups locally who are on the call, which is great. Cambridge Land Justice, who will say a few words after Guy, and it's also Save Honey Hill, Keep Water Beach Rural, regional CPRE uh, that I've noticed, and I'm sure there are more. Um, please do all use the chat to let everyone know what campaigns and actions you're involved in. Um, you have seen that guys agreed for the meeting to be recorded and we'll let you know when it's up on Friends of the Cam's YouTube channel. And if you don't want to be seen on the call, you might want to close your video off now. So a few words about Friends of the CAM, for those of you who don't know us, we were formed to campaign against the behaviour of the water companies, which were dumping sewage into our rivers and abstracting water to the extent that the integrity of our rare and biodiverse chalk stream system is under existential threat. But it fast became apparent that the rampant and concentrated growth in and around Cambridge is itself a threat to the rivers. Even so-called sustainable housing cannot reduce water consumption enough to avert the threat to the water supply, a fact that the Environment Agency acknowledges. The plans for around 40,000 new houses and flats and accompanying infrastructure in Cambridge and South Cambridgeshire will not only irreparably damage our precious chalk streams, but will contribute to the accelerating climate emergency an emergency that threatens the Fen landscape with inundation during the century we're living in. So we ask the question, who gains from these developments? It's not those in housing need. Accommodation prices, even those so-called affordable homes, have shot through the roof in parallel with new house building. It's not even for the majority of residents in and around Cambridge. But those who own the land, which is being sold and leased for development, stand to gain substantial. Some of them even sit on the bodies that decide whether and what development takes place, for example, the Greater Cambridge Partnership. Others gain influence in more convoluted ways, which provide interesting threads to unravel. Guy's book, Who Owns England, helps us to understand how those who now own land have acquired this privilege. For us, it's interesting to note that Oxford and Cambridge colleges combined own 126,000 acres of land and that 10% of the top 100 land owning companies in England and Wales are water companies, three of which hold the top three places and Anglian Water is 26th. The book is a gripping read and a great motivation to challenge this unfair, some may say corrupt system. We're delighted that Guy has agreed to talk to us about how land ownership plays out in Cambridge and Cambridgeshire and to discuss how we can begin to explore in detail who owns what land in order to challenge development decisions as well as the land ownership system itself and the inequalities it perpetuates. Guy wants this to be an opportunity for us to all share our skills as well as to learn from his experience and his keen for, for us to set up a Who Owns Cambridge group, similar to those that have been set up in Norwich and Oxford. So if you're interested in that, if you could also signal in the chat with your email contact, and if you don't want the rest of the call to see that, you can chat to me direct. Please also post questions, observations, ideas, and we can follow these up after Guy has spoken. And you can also use the raised hand icon. For this. Uh, but for now, that's it from me and over to Guy. Thanks very much, Guy. Thanks very much, Sue. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. And so this is this is my book that I wrote in 2019, came out, came out in 2019, and it's all about who owns land in this country. Um, land, in, in my view, lies at the heart of many of the problems and social crises we face, uh, whether that's the housing crisis, the uh, ecological and climate crises, or indeed the huge inequality that we now see economically and socially in society. And um, I found I got really interested in this, um, you know, some years ago now, sort of 2016 or so, 
uh, when I realized how hard it was to discover who owns land in this country and I wanted to start exploring it. So this is going to be a talk that first talks about, um, first touches upon why I think it's important uh, to, to grapple with this issue of who owns land. And we'll then turn to the question specifically of who owns Cambridge and Cambridgeshire. Um, oh. But uh, we'll also, but he's also intended, as, as Sue said, is to intend to try and give you some skills um, about investigating this yourself, because it's certainly not something I have a full answer to, although the, the title of the, my book is Who Owns England? It does have a question mark at the end. That's deliberate because it's not a, not a gazetteer of all the landowners. It's a question, it's, an, it's a detective story. And I'd love you all to become land detectives and to, um, as Sue said, to, to, to investigate who owns your area of land and, and see where that leads you, because I think it can be a hugely powerful tool in, in lots of different sorts of campaigns. The first thing to say about land in England and who owns it is how it's shrouded in secrecy. Uh, land ownership is, I think, one of our oldest and darkest secrets. It goes all the way back to 1066 and to the Norman Conquest and the Doomsday Book that followed 20 years after, after that. And it's remained something that's very bound up in power and wealth in this country, even in the 21st century, even though we may not think of ourselves as, you know, living in that sort of, in an agrarian country anymore, or a uh, country where, where big aristocrats rule the roost. Well, uh, I've got some news for you. <laughs> and uh, our countryside is obviously full of physical barriers like this keep out sign that I'm showing here, but um, the secrecy also goes deeper. It goes beyond the kind of the, the barbed wire fences and the walls that are uh, erected by landowners to keep our, the pri out the prying eyes of the public, it also goes into the very records around land ownership itself. Before we delve into that, into the secret of land ownership, let's, let's just touch upon why I think land ownership matters. And uh, firstly, I think land ownership matters because of inequality. Uh, Inequality in, in economic and social terms, you know, is, is, is obviously huge and increasing in England and in Britain today. And um, land is is part of that. Land ownership is part of that. By my best estimates and calculations, um, less than one percent of the population own half of all England. And um, that's based on looking at both land registry data, but also looking at uh, information that uh, the Department of the Environment published on. Uh, the number of farm holdings in the country. And this is an inequality that uh, of wealth and, and of power that goes back a very, very long way. Um, you know, around a third of England is still owned by the aristocracy and landed gentry by my estimate. Um, and many of these aristocratic and <clears throat> uh, uh, families can trace their ancestry all the way back to the Norman Conquest. It was William the Conqueror who really set the pattern of concentrated land ownership in this country all the way back then a thousand or almost a thousand years ago and he did so by vesting all the land uh, in England into the crown and then using and then using that power to parcel it out again to the church and the original 200 Norman barons who invaded England with him uh, some of whom are still still with us today the Duke of Westminster is, is, is his family is descended from one of the original Norman barons. And if you compare this expanse of land that is owned still by uh, a very small number of people with 5% um, of land owned today by homeowners, individual homeowners in this country, as you can see on this graph here, um, I think that's just quite a startling uh, gulf, really. Uh, despite, despite everything we're told by politicians about living in a property-owning democracy in which home ownership is, is the dream. And um, I just wanted to give you a sense also of, of how concentrated land ownership is. Can everyone just see these all these slides or is there a, is there a thing that's in the way? Are the, are the, um, the videos in the way or can you see the full slide? You should be able to see the full it screen, be, hopefully. It, it seems fine, Guy. Yeah, oh, that's good, that's good. I just wanted to check it wasn't being obscured by anything. So, so this is an example of a land ownership map. Um, we'll see more of these in a bit. This is a map of landowners in the county I grew up in, um, West Berkshire. Uh, you see Newbury there at the centre, uh, a, a town so good they had to put a bypass around it. 
um, back in the 1990s. Uh, that's when I was growing up there and environmental protests against the Newby bypass were quite formative for me. Um, they got me very concerned about 10, the 10,000 trees that were being chopped down, the four triple SIs that were being ploughed through in order to create a road that saved a few, few, few minutes off of a uh, off of a, off of a journey around the edge of Newbury. But what I didn't really realise when I was growing up there, although I clearly uh, could see that it was quite a leafy, leafy and well-to-do place, was that how uh, concentrated land ownership was in these um, very large estates. And um, just 30 landowners own nearly half of West Berkshire. And uh, about 40% of the population of West Berks lives in Newbury and Thatcham, which is outlined there in red. And you can see there how quite how concentrated the population is in a small area versus um, these vast estates, vast aristocratic and, uh, and sort of uh, newly wealthy estates. In fact, the biggest landowner in West Berkshire is the area's former MP, Richard Bennion, now Lord Bennion, uh, and he is one of the environment ministers in the environment department. So I think, again, there, the interplay of land, wealth, power uh, may seem something that's straight out of, you know, uh, a uh, uh, Hilary Mantel novel about the history of this country, but it is actually, I think, very living and breathing today. It's still, still very much part of our present. And to give you another example um, of a map of land ownership, just to demonstrate how concentrated ownership is in some parts of the country, this is who owns uh, a large chunk of Dartmoor, which is now where, where, where I, uh, near where I now live, which is in Totnes, uh, on the edge of Dartmoor National Park. And just 15 landowners own half of that Dartmoor National Park and the big area here in purple dominating um, dominating Dartmoor is um, the Duchy of Cornwall. Um, so the crown essentially or the heir to the throne. Oops. And there are various commons around the edges that are owned by private individuals. But it's not just about inequality, it's about land ownership matters because it intersects with a whole load of other issues as well, food and farming uh, being one of them. Um, we all have a stake in this, not just because we all eat food, of course, but because our taxes help pay for farming and how land is managed in, in this country. We spend about two and a half billion pounds each year on farm subsidies. And the way they've worked up until now has been essentially a subsidy for large landowners. It's based on the area of land that you actively farm. Uh, many, although, although many farmers are tenant farmers, a lot also are actually uh, a lot. A lot of farms are actually owned in hand, and are and are farmed um, by estates or an estate companies, and so they are the direct beneficiaries. Even when it's um, farm farming is done by tenant farmers, often you'll find that um, sub, the subsidies that we pay um, for for farming has ended up being reflected in in rents, and also has is reflected in inflated land prices. So what this graph is showing you here from the FT from a few years back is how, how farm subsidies have actually pushed up agricultural land prices in the UK um, and how there was a big rise in, in, uh, in the price of land, the value of land, um, around about the time when um, the, the cap system that we were part of when we were in the EU switched um, from headage or production payments to um, simply paying uh, farmers and landowners per acre of land that they farmed, and that's in about 2005, there's that particularly big recent rise. And whilst farmland prices did dip um, after the referendum, I think they have, I think it's true to say that the um, trend has reversed since then, and they've started rising again. And obviously there is a debate now, we're right in the middle of the debate, in fact, still, about how we, uh, how we subsidise farming, how we pay farmers and landowners um, to manage land in the future, and that's something we might touch on again later on in the talk. But who owns land is also, of course, has a huge impact on nature, uh, on um, the health of the ecosystems with which we share this country. And a lot of river pollution is of course caused by water companies uh, allowing storm drains to overflow and pour sewage into our rivers. But half of the problem of river pollution is also because of agricultural pollution. It's down to um, fertilizers and slurry being spread in vast quantities on our farmland higher, more than, more than can be absorbed by that land. Um, and, and it simply flows off and it often runs off into rivers and uh, pollutes them. Um, now we have the current government attacking environmental regulations, such as the um, rules around nutrient neutrality, as they have been called, and saying they're going to remove them and, and to remove various nature protections that we enjoyed when we were in the EU. 
uh, because they see them as a break on economic growth. And obviously I would argue that there ain't no jobs on a dead planet. And if you wanna have a healthy economy, you've got a healthy, healthy environment. Um, and I'm sure many of you agree, if not all of you agree. Um, so this is another reason to care about land and who owns it and how it's used. Climate, the climate crisis is also um, a crucial reason to care about land. Now, we obviously think often in terms of climate change about energy use and fossil fuels, but another part of the equation is also about the biological stores of carbon that we have and natural carbon sinks, because they're also crucial. If we're actually to get to net zero and beyond to go into negative carbon emissions, which is really what we ought to be doing in a major way to help uh, clean up some of this mess that we've helped create in terms of climate change, we need to be restoring our natural carbon sinks. We often hear about trees and tree planting, that has a place, but also we need to think about our peat soils. And this map here shows you um, where most of our soil carbon is found. It's found in our peat bogs, many of them in the uplands of England, also Wales shown here, but also, also as many of you may well be aware, quite close to Cambridge, quite, quite close to you is the Fens, and there's a vast expanse there of uh, of, of peat, um, these, these are the areas shown in dark red, um, uh, and um, that has been drained over the centuries. And it, it's, it's also the case that um, when I've looked into this, the ownership of our carbon also lies in the hands of a very small number of people. Only around 150 estates own um, the vast majority of our upland peat. And this is how they treat it. They set fire to it every year during the moorland burning season. This is purely for the purposes of, uh, of creating um, grouse moors in which people can go and shoot grouse uh, for fun. Uh, and um, in the lowlands, uh, on the lowland peat, of course, we have uh, another problem, which is has been intensive agriculture and drainage over the past few centuries, which has really damaged and desiccated the peat um, in the fens and other parts of low-lying low peat. And I'm sure many of you have seen in person, this, this uh, place, the Holm post, showing how the artificial drainage of the Fenland peat has caused the level of the land to drop by several metres in the space of just 150 years. Um, that's not just affecting um, the ecosystem and uh, the land, it's also has caused a huge amount of carbon to be released into the air and a lot of extremely fertile soil to be washed into the wash. Um, and the, and the concentrated pattern of loan ownership of the fens is also, is also something that's quite startling. When I've looked into this, I've done a report called Who Owns Our Carbon, which you can find on whoownsengland.org. And it looks at the ownership of the fens and it's, uh, as well as upland peat. And um, you know, many of the same names crop up again and again, the Cambridge Colleges, the church commissioners, various pension funds, all of them trying to invest in high quality farmland um, because they think it's a good long-term investment, but obviously it's not a very good long-term investment if the way in which you farm is causing all of this fertile soil to just leach out into the sea and into the and, and blow, blow away into the air. So some really hard um, decisions really needed. Well, uh, I think easy decisions really should be made actually, because we clearly need to be doing something different, but some, some very hard issues to grapple with here because we need to be um, engaging this elite of landowners in, uh, in, in managing the land differently. And lastly, I would say land ownership matters because it affects the public's access to land. This is a protest that I was on just at the weekend with a group of friends from Totnes. Uh, we went to a large estate um, on the southern edge of Dartmoor. Um, it's uh, an estate whose owners are in fact currently trying to sue the National Park Authority and take them to the High Court to um, say that we shouldn't have, the public shouldn't have a right to wild camp on Dartmoor anymore. And this has been a time honored right for a long time. Uh, and um, we think it was, thought it was fairly outrageous that this uh, landowner was throwing the weight around in this way. And so we went and had a wild camp completely legally on uh, an area of his, his 4,000 acre estate up on the moorland and then went and had a little trespass around his estate uh, with, this, with this banner. Um, but this isn't just a question of individual estates, it's actually also about the overall picture of, of land in England. We only have a right to roam over just 8% of the country. Um, it's great that we do, but many of those places are remote from uh, where many people live and uh, I'm part of a campaign, the right to roam campaign that is 
calling for an extension to that right to roam, particularly to places that are closer to where more people live, such as woods and rivers and greenbelt land. Um, and I think uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that over the, over the border in Scotland, there's been a, right, a full right to roam for the last 20 years. It seems to have worked rather well. So I think it'd be great if England started to move in the direction of, of, of its Scottish neighbourhood, of Scotland. So on to investigating land ownership. Hopefully I've convinced you that there are lots and lots of different reasons to care about who owns land. Um, and now I'm going to talk a bit about how you go about investigating it. So you theoretically ought to be able to just simply look up who owns land in the land registry. It's the government's official registrar of who owns land in England and Wales. But despite having been set up all the way back in 1862, it's still not actually finished doing its job. It hasn't actually registered all the land in England and Wales. We don't know who owns all the land. And about 15% remains unregistered even today. That doesn't mean that no one owns that land. It means that someone does, but it's very, very difficult to find out who owns it. Um, it's, in, in many cases, it's because it hasn't actually passed out of uh, uh, an aristocratic family not come onto the market or has been retained by the state or, or by the crown, for example, for a very long time. Um, and even for the remainder, the 85% of land that has been registered, um, you have to pay three pounds uh, to, for every land title and every uh, land map uh, that you want to be able to get that from the land registry. And uh, because there are 24 million land titles registered with the land registry, you do the maths, it's about 70, 72 million pounds if you wanted to buy all of them to find out who owns England and, and indeed who owns Wales. And I obviously didn't have that money when I started investigating who owns England. So I had to find some other routes um, to investigate it, uh, to become a land detective. Um, and so I started to do things like submit freedom of information requests to public bodies also to water companies because water companies are also um, uh, they are they're not open to the FOI Act but they are open uh, they are they are liable to be um, uh, asked questions under the environmental information regulations which are a similar set of, of laws um, and I started asking them for maps of land owned by water companies <clears throat> some of them gave that gave it to me freely others said bugger off, we're not going to give that to you, we don't think it's environmental information, I, I protested. Um, I looked up farm subsidy data, uh, maps of farm subsidy agreements to try and uh, investigate land ownership that way, um, and I found various other workarounds, um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of those in a second, but I wanted to just whet your appetite by showing you what you've all been waiting for, which is who owns Cambridge. And this doesn't give you the full answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, this is gonna be homework. Um, but this gives you a taster of who owns Cambridge. And each of these colored parcels here is denoting a different landowner. Um, I've added labels, I'm afraid, sorry, that they might be a little bit small for you to see, and we'll, we'll come to that in a sec. But um, you can start to see some of the owners here. You've got the Ministry of Defense, you've got Trinity College, Got the University of Cambridge rather than the colleges. You've got lots of individual individual names. Um, the Woodland Trust there. So what I really want to do is show you the interactive version because static, whilst all maps are great, um, interactive maps are even better. Brilliant. Okay. So what I'm doing here. Um, <clears throat> so so there's two things to explain. Firstly. I'll explain the program I'm, I'm looking at this in because this is this is useful and then I'll talk about the data and where I've got that from. So this is a program called QGIS. Shall I make it full screen? Some of the things at the edges. This is called QGIS. I'm not sure what the Q stands for but the GIS stands for Geographic Information System and there are various other software packages out there, Arc, Arc GIS and others but QGIS is the free one and it's open source and you can download it online. And that's, that I, I really recommend using it. Uh, it's something that I've, I've basically, I'm self-taught in using. I'm very much an amateur in all of this stuff. It's all self-taught. 
or other people who've told me, um, given me hints and tips. So it is something that you can uh, you can learn yourself, um, even if you don't feel like you're a computer geek or a, a mapping geek. Um, I have high hopes that all of you will become that over <laughs> over time. Um, this is what happened to me. So QGIS is a very useful and powerful tool for people trying to investigate land ownership. And um, what this does, let me just um, bring up one of the, I have to come out full screen, apologies, just to be able to easily do this. Um, but basically what you can do in it is you can not just look at a static map and see um, that, but you can start to point and click and find out more information from it. So this is telling us that that bit of land there that's highlighted in the pop-up box is owned by someone called Peter Bennett, apparently, who has a land agent called Savills. And it was registered in a certain date and is called a certain thing there. Okay, well, that's interesting. Let's have a look at this purple one here. Interesting. For some reason, Kent County Council owns some land in Cambridgeshire. Who, know, who knew? Um, so various bits of information can come from this. Let me just zoom out because that's not the whole picture. So this is actually, this is this data set actually is of all of Cambridgeshire. And where it comes from is um, a, it's, it's called a Highways Act map. And it, it, it exists because under the Highways Act 1980, section 31.6, uh, extremely boring uh, bit of legislation, but otherwise uh, very useful for us land detectives. Under that clause in that act, what landowners are allowed to do is to register their land with the local authority in order to protect their land against future rights of way claims. So I spoke earlier about how land ownership is bound up with public access. Here's an example of it. Landowners have a tool by which they can say, okay, I don't want the public creating new rights of way through my land um, over time. Here's a way I can, I can sort of safeguard my property against it. But what that means is that on the back end of lots and lots of local authority websites are maps of very large estates. And um, that means that we can start to investigate uh, land ownership using, using this, uh, using this sort of cunning little, 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 little tool and, and little ploy. Um, many local authorities publish this information simply as a series of PDF maps or you know, scanned in um, ordnance survey maps and they bung them onto the um, very obscure part of our website and it's not in a particularly useful format. But this one here, I think I FOI'd it some time ago from Cambridgeshire um, County Council and they uh, provided it to, it to me in this, in this format. It's called a shapefile. It's a GIS file, which means that it's interactive. You can play around with it. You can use it to analyze things. You can you know, start to copy and paste bits of it and start to interrogate it. So um, behind all these colorful shapes uh, lies something called an attribute table. I could just bring it up here. It's got all sorts of information in here. Um, we can see from the different columns what's in it. Uh, it's not just got the owner, uh, it's got all sorts of other things, but obviously what we're most interested in here is the landowner. So I'm just going to um, sort this by alphabetically and see if any particularly particular large landowners um, pop up. So we're scrolling through it here, and we can see Cambridgeshire County Council, for example. We can see the church commissioners. They crop up as owners of a number of different properties. We also have the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, they, uh, they bought up a lot of land in Cambridgeshire, I think in the 90s, possibly earlier. Um, some of this information, by the way, may not be 100% up to date. You know, this is stuff that's been deposited by landowners with the local authority over some time. So, for example, I think this is possibly now up to date. The fact that the Cooperative Wholesale Society, for example, is listed here as an owner of farmland. I think they probably sold up their land some time ago to another buyer. You see some of the dates here may stretch back a little way. So, with a lot of this information that you're looking into, you have to be wary of obviously changes over time. Sometimes the states are sold and, change, and it changes hands. So, um, you know, really ultimately, the ultimate um, source of information on this is going to be the land registry. But obviously, you don't want to have to pay out three pounds for every single tiny parcel of land, really. So this is why searching for 
proxy sources of information, I think is, is very useful and um, it's going to be handy for us. I'll just bring up, sorry, it's actually the wrong thing there. I'll just bring up um, a couple of the other um, data sets that I tend to draw on to try and investigate land ownership in any particular area. And uh, I've loaded them up here already and I'll just make them visible in the map. So what's coming up now, you can start to see it's becoming a complete jumble of, of things. This obviously looks like a nightmare to have to deal with. So you really have to kind of, this is why it's useful to kind of focus in on a particular area or a particular landowner rather than trying to make sense of absolutely everything all at once. What all of these orange parcels, I'll just get rid of the previous map, what, what all of these orange parcels are showing is environmental stewardship payments or countryside stewardship payments as they're sometimes called in this file. And um, this is a, uh, a part of the system of farm subsidies that we currently have, um, whereby the landowner has agreed to you know, carry out some sort of environmental stewardship of the land in some way, whether that's create a wildflower meadow or um, you know, plant hedgerows or, or whatever. And, and some of this information is published online as a series of maps. Now, it doesn't necessarily give you absolutely every owner. Um, it gives you the active farmer, but we can start to point and click at this information as well. For example, here, Stetchworth estate farms. Well, here's a clue already. We've got an estate being mentioned, especially if you start having things like not just simply the name of farmer or farm, but the estate tends to imply that it's a slightly larger um, entity, it might be a, an older, perhaps aristocratic estate. And I think in this case, Stetchworth, I think until recently was owned by the Duke of Sutherland. So there you go, that's another clue that you can start to use to investigate land ownership. Um, and um, just to give you one further bit of information here, that one further data set, um, I'm gonna bring up the actual full set of land registry cadastral parcels, as they're called, for Cambridge itself. So I'll zoom in so we get a better view of that. And this is, this is important to, understand. So um, essentially when we're talking about <clears throat> land ownership, um, one of the bits of one of the really important bits of data is the um, way in which land has been parceled up. So this might have been very old, this might have been the process of enclosure over, over the centuries, or it might just be a modern uh, land parcel associated with a garden or, or a property, for example. And we can see here there's a whole load of different sized and shaped parcels of land um, uh, around around Cambridge, um, you know, a lot of the parcels that look as if they're pure black here are actually just very small land parcels that when we zoom in, we can see they are for individual uh, homes and gardens. And, um, and the larger ones may relate to um, arable land or, uh, or parks or whatever. So we can flick, flick between the underlying map and this uh, land parcel map. They're called Inspire polygons and they can be downloaded from the land register website. But what this doesn't tell you at all, all this gives you is the kind of blank jigsaw, basically. It gives you the pieces, but it doesn't give you the picture. It doesn't actually tell you any of the landowners. You have to be able to relate landowners to each of these parcels. So if we click on some of the other layers that we had earlier, um, let's start off with the Highways Act map ones. We can start to see how we've, filled in, we've started to colour in some of the bits of the jigsaw, fill in some of the bits of the jigsaw, but obviously there are many, many more still to find if we're wanting to answer that question of who owns, who owns Cambridge and who owns Cambridgeshire. So this, um, these land parcels here in red are owned by, unsurprisingly, the University of Cambridge. I thought I might just um, zoom in on another area just because of your particular interest as friends of the CAM. Uh, which is, of course, to look at land ownership around the river. Um, and again, we don't have a full picture. I'm sure many of you will be able to help fill in this picture of, of, with your local knowledge of the area. I obviously don't have that knowledge. Um, I'm just trying to use um, data sets that I can get access to remotely. Um, but this is something very much which is what, good to be driven by local organisations, local groups, local networks of people who know the area and know who might own a patch of land that hasn't yet been mapped. But for example, here, along the banks of the river, we've got Grantchester Estate owned by King's College. And on the other bank, we've got uh, the Trumpington Estate uh, by, owned by someone called Pem Pemberton Settled Estates. You, I'm sure you're nodding here, so you, you know all about that. That's good. 
So, you know, in many cases, hopefully this won't be telling you new things, but what it might be doing is, is giving you tools to help fill in the blanks where um, there might be, you know, might still be uh, secrets and mysteries yet to uncover and, and things that you want to be able to find. Um, I'm just going to switch back to a few more slides and then go into kind of Q&A and discussion and more, more skills sharing and so on. But just to um, just to kind of recap some of those some of those data sets and a few others. So you know, to be to, to, if you're being land detectives and wanting to investigate land ownership in Cambridge and Cambridgeshire, we talked about the Highways Act, landowner deposit maps. We've talked about environmental stewardship maps. We've touched briefly upon this whole Inspire Polygons business that the Land Registry does publish, um, but which is shorn of the actual data of who owns those those parcels. There are some other data sets. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but I've just mentioned them here, and there's also a link there. Um, to where I have written more about this in terms of hints and tips on um, my blog, whoensengland.org slash forward slash tools and resources. Um, but there are other sources of data out there. There are some things that, to give them credit, Land Registry have published in more recent years. They have become slightly more open, which is that they've published information about particularly around companies, both UK and overseas. So that can include lots of offshore firms uh, who own land in, in this country. Um, but obviously also lots of lots of UK registered companies, whether that's water companies or uh, you know, supermarkets or whatever. Um, and there's a last set of uh, last data set that I'd, I'd point you towards as well, which is that many large um, estates also benefit from tax breaks, um, courtesy of HMRC. And uh, they do this for some good reasons and some, I would say, quite dubious reasons. Some of them do it um, because they uh, are claiming that they're looking after something which is a great heritage value and so in return for looking after it and giving the public access they get a tax break well in return for that they also have to publish a map of some of some parts of their estates on the HMRC website so um, again there's a link to those maps um, on my website at that at that URL um, and just uh, lastly I just wanted to also show you, uh, I mentioned a couple of the local who owns groups that have been set up um, in more recent more recent years. Um, it's been fantastic to see lots of people getting really interested in investigating land ownership in different parts of England. Um, my own project, Who Owns England, was in fact inspired entirely by Who Owns Scotland, which has run, been run by an amazing campaigner called Andy Whiteman for many years. He's, um, he's actually just launched a souped up version of his website and map, which you can subscribe to for not very much money, I think. Um, that helps him investigate land ownership. So I definitely check that out as well. Who owns scotland.org.uk, I think, um, if you want to look at that for inspiration. But who owns Norfolk and who owns Oxford? I wondered whether they might be inspirations for you guys um, if you are keen to do something of this sort, whether it's as a uh, separate standalone group or as a as a project of Friends of the Cam or of um, you know Land, Land Justice Cambridge or, or whatever but I think it's a really important part of kind of it's a really important tool in our arsenal so this is who owns Oxford very very uh, professional piece of work but all done by local folks in Oxford who um, got together uh, you know mixture of skill set people who are experts at GIS map make map making people who aren't at all but who are interested in the issue people who are interested in housing in the area and environment um, and they um, launched this I think been last year now um, I'm just going to try and show you uh, where was their map I'm sure they have their map on the front page possibly it's just loading still here we go there we go so they've they've gone with this um, interactive map um, which I think they've used Carto DB. So, so what you might discover, what if, if you decide to go down this route, you can do investigate this and, and create a project. Obviously, eventually you might want to be able to display the information you found. So rather than just having it all in big files sitting on someone's laptop um, for use on a desktop, uh, you know, piece of software like QGIS, you may want to be able to display um, that map information as an online map and uh, as an interactive map. And there are various, again, there's various um, things that you can use in order to do that. Some of them you have to pay to use, some of them are free. Uh, Carto DB and Mapbox are, I think, paid, both paid online mapping services. Um, 
I tend to have tried to use um, Google Maps, not because I have any particular love of, of Google, but because they do provide a free service for, for, for online mapping, at least up to a, a certain certain size of um, data set and uh, kind of you know, file size, essentially. So that's who owns Oxford. And very briefly also, um, this is who owns Norfolk. I think they've also used Google Maps. Um, so here you go, here is their progress in mapping who owns Norfolk. They've gone, they've done a huge amount really, um, but obviously still a long way to go. Um, so yeah, I, I think they're really amazing projects. Uh, I really hope that you guys feel inspired to also set up a who owns Cambridge and who owns Cambridgeshire project. So I think that is the end of my slides. That was brilliant, Guy. Thanks very much. Um, there are a number of questions coming up in the chat and also people have been helping each other out and um, telling us who Pemberton is and, and various other things. But we, before we go on, I'd like um, um, the Cambridge Land Justice to say a few words about what they're doing, because as they pointed out in the chat, they're putting a map together already. So Harvey, I don't know if you're here or one of your colleagues. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Guy. That, that, yeah, that was really amazing, the, the researchers. It's so, so thorough and it's really cool to see um, what other groups have done as well. We haven't done a kind of anywhere near um, that level of, you know, we what, what we've done with our, with the map data we have so far is in the next month or two, we're going to be launching a website um, called Landlord University, which is based on a couple of years of freedom of information and section 31 six, you know, research and, and that that's been mapped over the summer. Um, so we're going to be launching an online interactive map to show you what land the university owns. Um, and part of that is going to be um, a function for university tenants to get in touch with us at Cambridge Land Justice. Um, so we can kind of hold them to account for their landlording practices. Um, yeah, but so the, the website isn't up yet, but um, yeah, please do keep, keep an eye and, and, and hopefully it, it, it'll be up soon. Um, and should make a bit of a splash um but that's that's kind of not the main reason um we exist as cambridge land justice um our kind of we want to be a kind of a broader movement we want to um yeah the other thing we're kind of doing in tandem with launching um our map um is we're kind of rolling out a, a series of of workshops um across the oh what will the website be called? Uh, it's landlorduniversity.org. Um, but it will, if you follow Cambridge Land Justice on any kind of social media, um, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of keep keep people posted on, on the progress with that. Um, we're, we're really keen for this to be um, a coalition of, of, of students and non-students. Um, we're, we're already kind of running um, kind of talks and we did a film screening last week which was really great um and i think uh, yeah i met a few of you there um and yeah we want to think about the relationship with the university which has obviously been such a huge landowning force in the city and yeah the people of the town and how town gown relations can be improved um but yeah we the project is kind of there for people to take any way they they want um we want dignity community and access for all those are the the tenets of the campaign um and yeah just yeah develop like ways of living in community ways of redistributing resources in the most unequal city in the uk um and obviously there are <laughs> myriad ways of doing that so um please do get in touch um ask questions um that we're, we're a growing movement i would say um, have, I, have, I, have I missed anything guys? I feel we could put the socials in the chat if that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, we'll, um, we'll link our social medias in the chat. Sorry to fire loads of information. <laughs> um, yeah, and ask us any questions after we, we'll leave our email in the chat as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks very much Harvey and, and colleagues there and hopefully we can work together uh, going forward. Um, 
Simone, I, I notice that you've you've asked a recent question, but a few other questions as you've you've come up. Do you want to to say a word or two? Is Simone there? Hi there. Sorry, I'm using my mobile phone because I couldn't find my laptop in time, and um, it's taking me a little bit of a while to get used to using it. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, sorry, no, I was just wondering, because a little while ago, quite a few years ago, before I went to uni, I did a um, Rights of Way Restoring the Record course, and then I never got, it was just a one-day free course that was run, I don't know if it's the British Horse Horse uh, Riding Association and the Ramblers or something, but they were all doing this course to make sure that people didn't lose their rights of way throughout England and they were going to I can't remember what the law was but it was something to do with they were going to stop people from if a if a certain route wasn't particularly like registered or whatever before 2026 20, they um you know people might end up lo losing the right to be able to go on on the land and use those routes and I just didn't know if anybody else had done the training with them or if anyone else knew about them as well because I have a couple of books at home if people want to borrow them and use them to find out, because I think that might be a good way. They, they had lots of training where you had to go to the different record offices in London or wherever to find out who owned land and who you could apply for, because people were saying that they owned land when they didn't. So I think that's one of the annoying things is when people pretend that they own land and stuff. So, yeah, no, that was all, all I was wondering. So, um, yeah, I'm quite interested in maybe trying to pick up doing something because I never managed to do anything and tried. I never managed to get any pathways open or keep anyone, any um, things up to date. So, yeah, that was all. <laughs> Thanks, Simone. Guy, or does anybody have anything to respond to Simone with or? I can um, briefly come back on that and then if others wanted to come in as well. I mean, firstly, I just wanted to say, I don't think I properly got to say this, but uh, Harvey and, and, and Cambridge Land Justice Group, that sounds absolutely amazing what you're doing. So I'm very excited to see um, what you're producing. And obviously also, I meant to say earlier, all of this data that I've got, I'm gonna, I really want to send it to anyone who wants it. So, you know, if there's, ideally, if there's sort of one or two people who could be kind of point people for me to send the files to, uh, this is all to share and to, to give, you know, to share freely. Um, but Simone, and your point um, about rights of way, I mean, yeah, a very good point. And um, there has been um, a brilliant campaign by the Ramblers in recent years called Don't Lose Your Way. And they actually um, completed um, their map of historic rights of way that have been lost and found. This was amaz an amazing uh, right, wow. mapping and crowdsourcing project, um, crowdsource mapping project in which they got uh, loads and loads of people to basically um, do di digital mapping um, where they looked at um, maps that have been digitized, historic maps, and then drew in where those maps showed old rights of way that no longer existed on current day mm. maps. Um, so it's fantastic. And they they discovered that about 50,000 miles of wow. maps <laughs> have been lost um, since the late 19th century, which is pretty aston astonishing really. And you, know, you think, oh, well, where have they been lost? Down the back of a sofa? Exactly. <laughs> They've been extinguished by landowners often mm. have used you know it's not not quite the same uh tool as the highways act section 1.6 thing that's that's about future rights of way and um, preventing future rights away but it, they, they have essentially extinguished many of those footpaths um but what they have been trying to do is, is you you mentioned this 2026 cutoff point as well well actually the government well the government we had under boris johnson actually did promise to get rid of that deadline um which so which would have meant doesn't mean that suddenly we get all those rights away historic rights away back instantly, but it does mean that there's not quite such a pressure to register them all before 2026. Now who knows with this lot? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's funny you say that because I I just heard that at the weekend because I hadn't hadn't been yeah. keeping up about it and I was like oh I need to find out if that's true. So you're the second person who said that now, so that's interesting. Well, yeah, the Ramblers will of course have the latest on that, uh, and I don't know mm. if. Anybody is involved with the Ramblers or works with them, but uh, they'll have the latest on any. Mm. It will have to be some form of new legislation, I think, primary or secondary legislation, to make mm. sure that deadline is moved back or, or got rid of. And yeah. I have to say, I'm not sure our chances of getting that under this government are. <laughs> 
hopefully they won't notice and they'll be busy doing some other thing. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. Um, Jeff Smith has asked a, a question about land, changing land ownership. Um, Jeff, do you want to ask it? Because I'm not sure I un fully understand it from um, the compressed version in the chat. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. No, it's. Uh, um, I was really interested to see Guy using QGIS, which is brilliant that uh, people are using um, geospatial data sets. Um, I work in Earth observation, so I use satellite imagery all the time to map changing landscapes. And I just wondered if the next step after you've identified the ownership is to try and understand what is happening in these areas and, you know, whether they are improving or declining. Um, I, I, I do a lot of work with the European Commission. They have something called Copernicus, which is a satellite and geospatial data service. Uh, and even though we've left the EU now, uh, they have a really um, innovative, free, full, free and open data policy. So anyone can access these data sets. Uh, and there's a huge range from satellite imagery uh, through to things like uh, tree cover density, land sealing, uh, grassland areas, uh, conventional land cover maps, etc. Uh, I'll drop some links into the chat uh, and I'll put my email in as well. So anyone who's interested in using that, um, I mean, it's really important to get these things used. Even at some point, we may join again into Copernicus, but uh, unfortunately, we're on the outside at the moment. So, uh, but as long as we keep using the products, uh, then later on, we can we can have an influence there. So, I hope that makes sense, uh, Susan. That's great, Jeff. And and um, would you be interested in joining a group, putting together information? Yes, yeah, certainly. I'll, I'll drop my email in the chat, sure. and then you Brilliant. can get in touch with me. Thanks. Jeff, I think we've met before on Twitter. But only, that, only... <laughs> that's right. We're so, getting closer and closer in our virtual communication. But yeah, but yeah, yeah good to catch up with you at some point, Guy. Yeah, that's uh, great. Really um, interested in what you're doing. I think I think um, it's brilliant if you're interested in being involved because I do think, you know, and I'm sure uh, Cambridge Land Justice, you guys clearly have GIS skills as well. But I think to have a successful group or project on this, you need to have a kind of core of people who are prepared to do that kind of geeky level of map work. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's open to lots of other people to get involved and share knowledge, local knowledge about who owns what, and then start to apply it in lots of different ways. Yeah. And I think you, you found out there's quite a few free sources of information out there if you can dig around and find them and then exploit them. I think that's the, the key thing. Yeah. Cool, great, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there's a practical question about land ownership up and down. Um, so, if somebody owns land, how far up does that ownership go and how far down does it go? And somebody had a drone over their own land quite recently. Um, so I think Ellie Crane and Gina Burgess asked those questions. Gosh, um, that's a very good question. Um, I know that I don't think you, you don't own land all the way down to the center of the earth, um, put it like that, because um, you there are there are, there are separate mineral rights often registered um, by, by other parties. So a few years ago, there was a, an interesting uh, mini scandal, should we say, when um, basically the land registry said, uh, right, everyone needs to finish registering all their mineral rights by 2013, I think it was. And that led to various aristocrats who had um, ancient and long-standing mineral rights writing to thousands of homeowners around the country sending them letters saying, by the way, I own the metals and minerals underneath your house, um, which obviously got a lot of people very nervous. Now, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to come and develop and dig a quarry in your back garden or, or dig a mine, but it may mean that obviously you're, there are minerals uh, underneath your house that may be owned by someone else. Um, you, know, you may have to look in the land register to see if that's the case. I um, don't want to cause anyone to be feel nervous about this, but it's just one of the ways in which land law works in the UK. Um, I don't know so much about uh, air rights, you know, rights to um, the, the sort of space above your land. It looks like Jeff does. Um, but uh, I know also there are some companies that have bought up airspace rights above properties, um, particularly when things like solar panels have been put on roofs because they want to protect that land, uh, that airspace from being shaded out by other development in the area, which obviously would affect the generating capacity of the solar panel. So again, you get into all this sort of 
you sort of think it should be simple, but you get into all these complications about actually who owns bits of air and bits of earth and, you know, the earth's core and stuff like that. So it is, it's very weird. I do find the whole concept of owning land deeply strange. And ultimately, I didn't, I actually think that really we, we, the earth doesn't belong to us. We belong to the earth and we need to get more closer to that way of thinking again. But we are stuck in a system, a legal and economic system in which we own land. In fact, we invented this way of thinking about land ownership and I think we need to start to dismantle it. Shall I quickly come in there? At the, um, I mean, obviously I work with satellites, not drones. Um, but from what I know about the drone issues, if you're just a private person, you should only be flying over land that you own or uh, is kind of community land, which has permission to actually fly drones. If you're a professional drone flyer, I think you can then, uh, you then have more um, ab ability to fly, but you still then have issues around being within line of sight of the operator. And, um, and then if you fly too high, there are issues about um, uh, air, uh, flying into uh, you know airspace, air traffic control issues. So uh, yeah, so if a drone does appear over your land, I mean you're probably well within your rights to find out who's who's flying it and why and why are they flying it. Sue, can you can you see the people with their hands up? No. Okay, because several people have got their hands up. Shall oh, I? Do you want to introduce them? Okay, so there's Miranda. You've had your hand up for a while. What what what's your question? or comment. You'll have to unmute yourself and then we'll hear. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I wanted to come back when um, Simone was talking about the 2026 cutoff. Um, I mean, Guy kind of answered it in terms of the Ramblers and I'm intrigued to hear that the Ramblers think they've finished and done it all. Um, I belong to the British Horse Society and I work on access for the British Horse Society. Um, and we are still beavering away, finding either completely lost rights of way or uh, in many, many cases, far too many cases, rights of way that have been recorded just as footpaths when the, historically, from historical evidence, they should have been bridleways. And that work is uh, still very much ongoing. Um, and one of the issues uh, that we have is we submit these, they're called definitive map modification orders, DMMOs, uh, British Horse Society now has uh, like well over a hundred of them um, in with the County Council and the County Council don't have anyone to process them so goodness knows when they'll all actually be dealt with and whether we'll ever actually get these um, new or upgraded rights of way in place but it's not just about ramblers please it's about horse riders and cyclists as well. Absolutely. Just just to say on that, I didn't mean to imply that the Ramblers have, have finished the job. They, I think they've they've done a big chunk of uh, a, a very hefty job of of finding historic rights of way uh, for, as you say, footpaths. But that doesn't, uh, as you rightly say, um, cover higher access rights for and bridleways and and indeed access for cyclists in many places as well. So yeah, it's not job done. And quite rightly to say. Once you've just identified the historic rights of way, you then have to go through this extremely laborious process of actually trying to get them registered by the local authority, um, which is obviously going to take years. And that's why the deadline of 2026 was such a such an issue and remains such an issue until it has been removed from the statute. Okay. Harry, I think you'd like to say something. You'll need to yeah. unmute. Yeah, yeah. You've, yeah. Done it. you've done it. Um, cheers. Yeah, no, so. I guess just to come off with one a comment that I think Harvey wrote earlier. So um, yeah, so there's now a um like Cambridge Land Justice uh, Right to Roam Working Group. I actually work at the National Rights of uh, Right to Roam campaign with Guy. If anyone wants to join that, I guess get in touch with the Cambridge Land Justice Group. But um, that's going to be really really good fun. And I think there's a lot of cool stuff that we can chat about in terms of Right to Roam in Cambridge and Cambridgeshire. Um, I'm actually based in in Ashford, which is one of the sources of the River Cam. And uh, I personally would love to do some kind of um, trespass or action around Right to Rome, around the River Cam, or something along those lines. But um, definitely everyone should get involved with this, with Right to Rome on a local issue, and we can hopefully create a really cool local group for Right to Rome around Cambridge and Cambridgeshire and get everyone excited and involved, which would be fantastic. So, yeah, that's it. Did you put your details in the chat, Harry? 
Um, imagine, Harvey, you might have the details of that. I mean, I can put my own email, but I put can't. your own email because I think the idea of doing a right to roam around the camp is very attractive to us in Friends of the Camp. So that's it. That sounds great. I'll do that now. So we, we, we could organize something together. Yeah, that would be great. We can organize it with Right to Roam and, and many other organizations. Yeah, that. Cool. Great. Mm. Jani, would you like to say something, ask a question? Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, ask a slightly or discuss a slightly different issue, and that is the ownership of land by the city and council and county council in Cambridge. And um, particularly, we're particularly interested in this because of the um, the community campaign around St. Matthew's Peace, mm -hmm. uh, where we discovered uh, that, first of all, we didn't, we, we, we discovered that the county council, uh, which got, which got ownership of the uh, north half of St. Matthew's Peace, uh, when there was a reorganization such that uh, the county became responsible for education and the Howard Mallet uh, was characterized as a Howard Mallet Center was characterized as an educational institution. So they then got uh, control of that. And, and in the end, we have been fighting for like 20 odd years uh, to protect our one tiny park in Petersfield, which is has is the um, ward in Cambridge with the least uh, green space per per person, um, and discovered that the county council had first sold the land to sold the freehand freehold of the land for forty thousand pounds, and then within six months had flipped it <laughs> and sold it to P BNP Paribus for nine and a half million pound, all without the knowledge, without our knowledge. We only discovered this in the latest camp battle that we, we, we had. And uh, because the 2011 Localism Act established this concept of assets of community value and the right for community organizations to bid for, for, for land and the necessity uh, for this to go out to consultation and we didn't we never heard it so there was absolutely anything about it and the even the, the, they said that the county that our county councillor in Petersfield had been informed she had not been informed and there was no record that she had been informed so you know this kind of <laughs> corruption or you know fraudulent behavior really on the part of the county council uh has, has, you know, we, we have been deprived of land which we hold dear. So I just wondering, you know, we've, we're talking about private and we're talking about the colleges, but what about land which in theory is owned by people, by the people of Cambridge, you know, the council lands and common lands? Uh, what, you know, what, what can we do about these sort of issues? Do you, do you want to say something, Guy? Oh, just briefly. I mean, that, that sounds like a really uh, awful uh, incident that's that's uh, that's happened. I'm sorry to hear about that. I mean, I think um, that I, I didn't really touch upon council land ownership, but really, that's something that um, every council should now be publishing as a matter of course. Is their asset register, as it's called. Um, that's uh, and and really, they 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 should be publishing a full map of land ownership. There isn't really isn't really any reason why they shouldn't now do that and I think you should definitely request one uh, if, if you if you wish to um, and try and get it published as a matter of course so um, uh, and, and that might you know might help it might resolve necessarily issues like the one you've raised but I think it can help with public scrutiny of, of ultimately what is land that is owned by the public uh, and in the public's name um, and I think that sort of level of transparency just getting that kind of transparency uh, normalised within councils is, is something that's is really important. You know, some councils like Sheffield City Council, for example, now publish all their land ownership data as a map, um, just fully publicly online. I mean, in, in this specific instance of what you're talking about, I think it's really great that you've raised the Localism Act um, and um, community right to bid. Um, something I've long thought is necessary in England is a proper, strong community right to buy 
such as the type that exists in Scotland, um, subtly, sounds subtly different to what we have. It's actually very fundamentally different in that um, uh, community groups in Scotland have first right of refusal on assets of community value, um, whereas here it's still, uh, you know, you're still up against basically anyone who wants to bid for it. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know obviously the details of the case that you've, you've raised, but it, I think it's, it touches upon this co concept of the sell off of public land and also the need for stronger laws in England um, to allow communities to, to buy land back, essentially, uh, to take it back. And um, uh, I'm pleased to see, though, that the Labour Party are starting to talk about community rights buy in England. So I can, I can uh, recommend having a read of what Lisa Nandy said a few weeks ago uh, in a speech she's she's talking about community right to buy introducing that in england if, if labor get into power at some point so um things are starting to shift i think things are starting to change around this can i can i just <coughs> come back and just mention that um the saint Matthews uh peace group uh is unfortunately meeting tonight just at this moment they have a council meeting and therefore uh they couldn't attend but I know that Al Neal in particular, who's you know a moving real moving force in the group, would very much like to speak to you. She's been trying to kind of contact you. So, and because this is being recorded, she will hear your talk. And I hope that you would uh, make some time to talk to her about this particular issue. Thanks, Jenny. I noticed that Val was on the. She was able to stay until Guy finished talking. Yeah, I've got to go. She's. It's great. Um, she can, uh, the, Sam Davis, who's uh, our only independent councillor in the city, um, just has mentioned in the chat that um, the data has recently, city council data has recently been re removed. Sam, I don't know if you want to say a few words about that and what you're doing in talking to the county's maps team. Yeah, so um, the, that link takes you through to a, a county maintained map, um, which I've found quite useful in the past. Uh, it used to have the city council, date, city council data on it, and the last time I used it wasn't there. I asked the county maps team what had happened. I don't think there's anything particularly sinister about it. It just they, they felt the data was sufficiently out of date that it was unreliable and therefore it was better removed. The conversation I'm having with them at the moment is what's the alternative then? Um, because it's it's far too useful to just lose access to it altogether and it clearly exists. So how can we get it out there? I mean, obviously, as a city councillor, I don't have any particular sway with the county. They're being nice to me at the moment while I pursue this conversation with them. Um, I think Hillary is maybe still on the call and um, possibly it's something that that she and I can collaborate over to get it moved up the uh, the to-do list but it's it's so it was so useful to be able to 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 just interrogate where where the parcels of land owned by both councils were. Thanks Sam. Hilary do you want to say a few words or would you be able to help with that? If you're still here, maybe maybe she's, not. maybe she's gone. Could, could I just mention a linking issue, which is um, who owns our schools and and the land around them? Because a few years ago, I started trying to work out what was happening to the land ownership in schools because I'm very very fearful of the way in which land is being shifted from council ownership to um, department for education ownership, and then possibly out to the um, academy trusts. And, and it's, it's, there are maneuvers around school land which make um, education ripe for sell-off at, at some point and very attractive to, to, to buyers because of the, the link to land. I wondered if Guy had thought about that issue. I'm afraid you got me there. I, I haven't thought about that at all. I, I thought I uh, very briefly heard and read about the things like sell off of school playing fields and other, uh, you know, th things like that. And I believe there's a, some sort of ministerial lock on that. 
Um, but I am not aware, and obviously, uh, obviously see from a distance the sort of creeping prioritization of lots of the education system, but I don't know very much about that at all. So that's something definitely worth looking into, I would imagine. Uh, maybe something we could add on to our efforts here to understand what's happening to land ownership, because I think there are shifts. It's a bit like public, because school land, school playing fields, essentially a, a common land. They're, they're what should be should be owned by the community and open in some way to community use and that is disappearing from the community and that's i mean in a, in a county like norfolk that's vast areas of land anyway um so there's, there are two or three other people here who've got their hands up okay do, do you want to identify them kieran hi uh, good evening evening um yeah, thanks for the talk, Guy. I really enjoyed your book as well. It was really, really interesting read. I should probably add a disclaimer as well. I'm a town planner for the, the um, Greater Cambridge Planning Service, but I'm here personal capacity. <laughs> so please don't add me in the chat. Um, but I have, I have a question about um, the future of land ownership. Be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, so, you know, historically, the question of land uh, tax and ownership has been very vexed uh, in the political sphere. So, you know, in the 60s, 70s, Labour had the betterment tax um, repealed on three or, or four separate occasions by Conservative Party. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about how changing land ownership um, can be achieved when you know, kind of processes such as the expansion of compulsory purchase order or even a rehash betterment tax would likely be met with quite fierce um, political opposition con considering the history of that in the 1670s. Yeah, very good point. Thank, thanks, Kieran, and I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Um, and I think the um, uh, where to begin? <laughs> uh, I it keep it keeps on uh, going back and forth. This debate keeps on rumbling on, even though it's uh, much more um, under you know sort of uh, subterranean now, rather than sort of out in the open. There, there was a there was in fact a consultation put out by um, former Minister Michael Gove. Uh, about um, the issue of, of uh, land compensation and uh, essentially councils and development um, operations being able to buy land closer to existing use value. And I don't know where that consultation has gone. I imagine that it's going to go the way of lots of things that have been torn up in recent weeks. Um, I actually thought, saw that as a glimmer of hope that there was a sort of start of a even a cross party consensus on the need to tackle spiraling land values when it comes to house building um, because you know you can keep churning out more and more homes and house build, uh, and building more houses but if they're unaffordable that's not really resolving uh, uh, the issue and, and obviously a large part of the value of a property is ultimately bound up in location value and the value of the land and the like and the like the house so I think you know you're yeah, we really do need to contend with this and you're quite right to point out that um, you can't really do that if you're just going to, if one government brings in something and then you get a developer strike or a landowner strike refusing to bring forward land for housing and the, waiting for the other party to get back in and repeal it all again. Um, so I, I, I don't know the answer, I don't know the solution to that. I think that there is, I can see the glimmers of a slightly different future for land ownership in England starting to come over the horizon. I hinted at earlier when I mentioned uh, community right to buy, because I do think there is a, a, a greater scope for community-led housing efforts, community ownership of, you know, not just of uh, pubs which are, and, 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 you know, community uh, town halls or whatever, but I think also for communities to become more invested in things like rivers, for example. Uh, you know, why, why, or, you know, why not, why not have a community and river? Um, why, why could the CAM not be vested in the people of Cambridge? Um, rather than the different colleges or whoever owns it currently. Um, obviously, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of the River that you, you've made before is just to try and give the, per, the river itself a sense of personhood or, or legal personhood, but perhaps a step towards that is to vest it in uh, the ownership in, in the community. Um, beyond that, I do think there are other things that could be done and, and may well be done in future under different governments around taxation of land, um, may not come through uh, betterment taxes or similar things like that, or, or, or even a full-blown land value tax, which has obviously been tried and, uh, and then subsequently repealed as well uh, a long time ago under, under Lloyd George. 
but it could be in the way in reforms of things like inheritance tax or, or, or aspects of that, particularly around agricultural property relief, um, and certainly making more, you know, attaching more strings to, um, you know, when, when tax breaks are, are given to large landowners on these sorts of things. So those might be certain routes to different features on land ownership, but I also think it's about changing how, uh, changing the bundle of rights that come uh, with land ownership in England. You know, we have a very absolutist approach that land ownership has all these, you know, the landowner has sort of absolute right of but to exclude people from, you know, their 10,000 acres or whatever, as well as, uh, as well as to be able to, um, you know, farm it or, you know, develop on it in, in line with the planning system. But I do think that that some of those things could be unbundled. You know, that's what that's what right to roam is 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 saying. Look, there are other there are other capitalist, democratic, liberal societies in other parts of the world, not very far away: Sweden, Scotland, uh, Germany, parts of Austria, where actually landowners don't get to exclude absolutely everyone from you know their their their, their, their land. Um, that you know things like forests are free to roam in, rivers are free to swim in and so on. So I think that's a that's an alternative future as well for land. So that was quite a long answer. Apologies. Oh, thanks, very comprehensive. No, thanks a lot. And Kieran, if you're able to help identify land ownership in the councils, that would be really helpful. And uh, it'd be great to have you on the project. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do, but <laughs> I'm, I'm on my, uh, my, my free time tonight. But <laughs> there's, there's Alan, Alan wants to say something. Um, yeah, um, if I could perhaps uh, address uh, some of Jani's concerns, or one of Jani's concerns. There is a way, Jani, of protecting uh, land which people have access to um, other than owning it, and that is to get it registered as a local green space. Okay, and that's done through the planning system. It's done at the time of a local plan. You can apply to the council to get, a, get land registered as a local green space. Uh, Cambridge actually has a lot of local green spaces. Uh, there's a full list of them on the Cambridge News website already um, that was compiled a few years ago. Um, but it's certainly worth doing that because Cambridge is currently in the, in the process of uh, re-evaluating re its local plan. So now is the time to get open spaces within Cambridge registered and, and in villages and uh, other communities as well in South Cams registered as local green spaces and CPRE would encourage you to do that uh, very much and there is information on the CPRE website about that. Um, our second point coming back on Tony's uh, issue about schools, um, <clears throat> there has been an instruction, it was a few years ago now, uh, to all local authorities that they must register all land that they own on the land registry. And the reason for that is because government wanted uh, developers to be able to see it. And so um, you're right, Tony, uh, land around schools is at risk. And um, uh, that was certainly has been a government policy for some time that if they can sell off a, a local government owned land, uh, they will. And I think we need to be aware, <coughs> we need to be very aware of that. Great. Sorry, Preston, you wanted to say something? Yes, it's Johnny rather than Katie. John. It's following up from what Jenny was talking about with St Matthew's piece and Kathy's comment in the chat. Of course, you've got the former Mill Road Library, which at the moment the County Council has put up for sale. And that is an asset of community value. And it's current, the current situation is there was a deadline of 16th of September for expressions of interest to buy from community groups. PACT put in an expression of interest, not out of their own direct interest, I don't think they can take it on, but it's opened up the possibility for other community groups. And just to say that um, a month ago, in fact, less than a month ago, there was a meeting organized by Councillor Mike Davy, and a number of potential groups came forward with potential ideas and I'm doing my best to help them, but it'd be really good to have for people to know that that's the future is up for grads at the moment people are interested in that lovely building and it's worth having a look if, if you haven't it's a great opportunity for the commu local community and others to try and find something that would 
continue in community use, whereas the county council decided to sell in a process that was delegated, it will only come forward for any public decision at the time they're considering the actual bids that are made. So there's a real issue there in terms of when public authorities take the decision to sell publicly owned land. Thanks, um, that's, that's really interesting. And maybe that's something that different groups here might want to discuss with you, um, if, if that's possible. Just, just to say, sure, I'll put, I'll put my email in the chat. So. Great, thanks. thanks Any other hands up, Tony? Uh, there's no, there are no more hands up, and uh, there are there are other comments in the chat. Yeah. But we're getting up to. What do you feel about the time? Yeah, I just um, there was something about Midsummer Common friends of Midsummer Common who were asking for some help. Um, oh yeah, is it Kit from Midsummer Common? Do you want to? Hello. Um, okay. Yes, there is a um, Walder area next to Midsummer House, the restaurant, which would form an ideal location for a kitchen garden. I have emailed every single council officer I can imagine to try and establish exactly who is responsible for the space, who owns it, um, and I've had zero joy. So if anybody could, help us with working out who's responsible for that space, we would be delighted. Um, like I say, presently it's used for storing pallets for bonfires and that's it. So, you know, there is no other land use. I am concerned that if we don't establish who's responsible for it, it will be sold to the restaurant. So, uh, you know, it it would be great if anyone who uh, I have asked, uh, I see in the comments, ask the person who grazes her cattle. I have tried to ask Angelica if anyone has a, um, I haven't managed to meet her, but I'm not sure she knows about it. It hasn't been used as a pound for livestock for a while, like five years. So, um, yeah, anyone who knows anything about that area, please let me know. My email will be in the chat. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that that be, I don't know, Alice, if Alice, this falls within Market Ward, if you're still on the call, if that's something that you'd be able to help with. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. <coughs> um, Thanks, Kit. Yeah, we yeah, we've met I, previously <laughs> to chat. Yeah, about we have. Yeah, um, and I'm very happy to take this off again um, to see if there's anything we can do. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. It'd be very, very sad if this land got sold on, and if especially if it's land, common I land, mean, um, that would I'll be, be great. Honest, Alice, it's not currently locked up. I don't mm. know if the council is aware. And quite a few of my volunteers are sort of thinking maybe after the bonfire, when the pallet's gone, maybe we could start clearing it up. Sure. Well, <laughs> <laughs> currently the um, council has an environmental improvement scheme where you can bid for some funding. So maybe we can bid for some funding to put in. But we can't bid for the funding unless we're sure we have a license to mm -hmm. manage that land and we don't really know who to apply to. Mm -hmm. so, you could just yeah. start. Well, yeah, um, kind of a heads up. We <laughs> probably will, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, and just, there are a few local issues um, coming up on the chat, including the Cambridge Lakes, um, but I'm wondering if we should formally bring the, the meeting to a, a close, but leave the lines open for anyone who's wanting to touch base with anybody else on the call or with friends of the CAM uh, or with Cambridge Land Justice. 
Um, we really appreciate you spending this time with us, Guy, and sharing your experience and your expertise. And I, I think there's loads of stuff here to help us get going. And it would be good to keep in touch with you as well. And we certainly to let you know how we're doing and sharing anything that we've we've got. Um, we've got a, a few people have mentioned environmental legislation. Our next talk is from Lisa Foster, who who's an environmental lawyer with a, a company that specialises in environmental law. I've put the connection in the, the chat. It's an Eventbrite. And we've also asked her to talk about the torching of the uh, environmental legislation, which is um, sort of poten potentially, unless that's another U-turn that's, that's going on. So that's on November 2nd. Please sign up for that if you're interested. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to have a, a last word. Maybe, maybe Guy does. But I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I was going to encourage, I was going to encourage you, Guy, to sort of build more about uh, a challenge to the whole concept of the ownership of land into oh, what gosh. you have to I say. Know. I don't I don't have the last word, but uh, I, I just wanted to say thanks very much uh, to everyone for coming and thanks for inviting me. And also um, very cheekily, if I could plug uh, my next book, which is coming out at the end of this month, which is about a slightly different subject, which is called The Lost Rainforests of Britain. So that's what I kind of do now. Land ownership is sort of a hobby. <laughs> but um, yeah, anyway, so um, but I'm really glad that it was useful. I hope, I hope it was. And I hope um, I'd obviously also really like to be able to share and pass on all the data I showed you earlier, all the maps and so on. So to be able to send that to people. So um, they're quite large files, but I can send them via WeTransfer or whatever to, to anyone who wants them. Um, ideally, though, I'd rather not do that to sort of 116 or 189 people individually. It would be great if there was uh, perhaps a way to kind of, um, you know, share it with a, a point person or if that's uh, if that's going to be you, Harvey, you're putting your hand up. <laughs> don't know. Or, uh, or Maybe or... with Harvey, Cambridge Land Justice and with Friends of the Cam, we ah, could yeah. always put it on our website, summarise the, the chat yep. and just circulate it amongst the people who are on this cool so that everyone has the um email addresses and um contacts um so i'll do a follow-up email in, in a couple of days if that works so thank you thank you guy very much um thanks to all those who have come on the call and for the work that you're doing in various campaigns and as i said we're, we'll keep the zoom open for a little while for anybody else who wants to have a chat or um, connect with anyone. Hopefully see you all soon and good luck. <laughs>